All right. Good morning, Doug. We are back with questions from members of the file. So first of all, first question, does Doug really believe anyone anywhere will escape the coming tyranny no matter where they live or the preparations they made? <clears throat> well, I can only quote Joe Lewis. You can run, but you can't hide. Mm -hmm. And uh, it seems like the uh, great flow of history is in that direction. So the best you can do is insulate yourself, go to places that seem better and have assets that will buy you more freedom. But no, yeah. I don't think so. There are places where you might be more affected than other places. And there are situations which could be worse, but there's no way to totally insulate yourself from it. Yeah. And since charity begins at home with people that you are neighbors with, hang around with, relatives, I mean, if they have bad values and bad attitudes, disconnect from them. I mean, that starts, that's first. Yeah. Okay. Next question. Doug, you've lived in many places all over the world, but what brought you in all of those places and how did you decide to leave them? Was this a conscious effort on your part to get up and go every so often, or do you have a long-term plan for your travels or did mm -hmm. you have a long -term trip? Yeah. Conscious plan. It was a semi-conscious plan, I guess. <laughs> I mean, I never liked the idea of being rooted like a, like a potted plant, which philosophically and personal, I don't see it as a survival strategy. So um, actual plan? No, I don't think so. Uh, when I come to a fork in the road, I take it. And mm. uh, <laughs> no. Was, it, was there something that drew you originally, though, to like New Zealand, for instance? What was it that, you know, made you decide to, to be based there for so long? Actually, it was the polo. Because... Uh, when I was getting into polo, uh, I realized that <clears throat> polo in New Zealand was very unlike polo in Palm Beach, which was a bunch of really rich, arrogant guys hiring Argentines for a lot of money to play a silly sport with them. But uh, hanging out in New Zealand, uh, you know, and of course I checked out the polo community, I found that they were a bunch of tough farm boys that liked to uh, play horse hockey when they weren't playing rugby. And that's a fact. Mm. Forget about the pros and all the rest of that nonsense. So uh, I just liked it much better for that reason. So that's, and, then when you... and my timing was good because the costs were very low because the New Zealand dollar was in the toilet. And, you know, any Kiwi that had two nickels to rub together was moving to Sydney or LA or London. Hmm. just find something of interest and then that leads you there it's not like it's it's not really part of a larger plan no i mean look the last the last thing that i wanted to do i couldn't talk my wife into uh spending six months in kinshasa in the congo i mean that was just a bridge too far uh and she didn't want to go to moscow either although now She's kind of interested, although she wants to go to uh, St. Petersburg, not Mos Moscow. But, you know, I I'm kind of over that, frankly. So I guess those, those are a couple. I think they would have been interesting ships that have sailed. Okay. Um, you've mentioned ancient coins before. That uh, Are there some, what are some of your favorite ancient coins? Well, it boils down to, <clears throat> from my point of view, uh, Greek and Roman coins. And uh, the Greek coins <clears throat> are generally more artistic uh, than the Roman coins. Uh, but uh, actually, it's those ancient coins that, especially Roman coins, because you can see how they degraded over time during the days of the Republic. Uh, uh, Roman coins always had um, a god or or 
an idea, uh, a representation of an idea like justice or whatever on, on the on the coin. And then of course it went to the emperors and then they started de degrading after the emperors, after actually Nero, uh, reducing the amount of silver in the coins. And um, the artwork became crappy in addition to the sil lack of silver content. And um, it's the same thing here in the US. Most people don't think of that, of course. It's that uh, we used to have gold coins, which had liberty, standing liberty, and so forth. And then the gold coins went out of circulation. And then uh, uh, with, our, with our ordinary day-to-day -day coins, uh, the first time we put a uh, political figure on the coin was within the, uh, with the Lincoln penny in 1909. Mm. Mm. Uh, okay. Uh, and then the Buffalo nickel uh, uh, was replaced by Thomas Jefferson uh, in, what was that, the late 30s? Uh, so once again, putting a, pol a good politician, yeah, yeah, right, okay. But uh, I'd rather have the buffalo and an Indian on, on my nickel than some political figure. Uh, then the dime, it used to be the mercury dime, you'll recall, and it was replaced by Franklin Roosevelt, very recent president, okay? Now we're not just talking about mythical presidents way back when, we're talking about current presidents. And uh, then the uh, same thing happened with the quarter. It used to be the standing Liberty quarter replaced with Washington. Good, you know, same thing happened with uh, the half dollar. I mean, it was uh, a Liberty half, half dollar. First with Benjamin Franklin, okay, good guy. But then with Kennedy, well, okay. Uh, not such a bad guy, but very recent. Then Eisenhower. I mean, we're moving more and more up to uh, people that are just were just recently in office. So yeah, it's the same. Pro it's the same prog progression as the Romans had, and of course, all the while. Now they then they even took the copper out of pennies. So when we were kids, you know, bad kids, you know, run up to a cop and say, "What are pennies made out of? Dirty copper." <laughs> no, but uh, can't say that anymore because copper pennies are now made out of zinc. But even zinc is such that it costs three cents of zinc to make a penny. So, mm. uh, but 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 coinage is going out of it. It's mm. it's dead duck. We're not going to have coins in our pockets. So anyway, is there uh, a favorite ancient coin that you can that you have in your collection that you can recall that stands out to you? I think everybody's famous. Everybody's favorite is probably the Athenian owl. owl. Mm. And, uh, as far as artwork, uh, the uh, Pegasus from Corinth. It's just really beautiful artwork. Mm. So, All right. I'll well, done. Done. well done, Morris. So, but you know, having too much um, collectible junk is a bad idea. So I think, you know, getting a, a few nice ancient coins that you can look at to remind you of the fact that even if we go back to the, the days of, of Socrates, uh, that's only the lifespans of, um, well, let's see, we're talking 2,400 years. That's only the lifespans of, uh, let's say, 30 or 40 long live men that all could have known one another. So when you look at it that way, that's not, it wasn't that long ago. Mm. And before that, we were just beating on earth with a stick and living in caves, basically. Well, let's just, just don't want to go back to that. That's the hope. No, no, I really, I really would like to avoid that. Uh, let's see. Next question. It says, during a recent discussion, uh, we both critiqued game theory uh, exactly the way I do. And he was delighted to hear that. He said, I think it's mostly disconnected from reality. He said, on the other hand, I think it informs manipulators for the purpose of conditioning the masses. Um, 
to condition paradigms of thought, he says, around particular issues, and then influencing the news media and social media to emphasize the input factors and exclude unacceptable reactions. Anyway, he says, I'm curious about your thoughts around game theory as a tool of manipulation rather than a tool of analysis of unconditioned or unconstrained people. Yeah, good point. Maybe that's a testimony to the fact that the bad guys are smarter than we are. But uh, I don't pay any attention to it because I don't like the idea of manipulation. I don't like being manipulated and I don't like manipulating other people. It's just so. It's gross. It is. So I probably foolishly don't pay a lot of attention to it. Yeah, you can see how it would definitely allow for manipulations because if you can if you can uh choose the range or the method of interacting you've already you you know it's like how like an overton window for instance really limits the debate from you know i think the game theory when you're when you if you focus on uh trying to gain advantage or trying to that you must respond to your an adversary you know versus like someone like um uh I would say somebody who I business wise never engages in game theory is Bill Bonner. Like he will just not participate ever in any of that stuff. Like you no. can't induce him into any of anything. Whereas <laughs> that's considered stupid. Like, well, of course you should engage. Of course you should try and do something. He's like, no, no, I don't, I don't, I don't argue. I just don't argue. Yeah. And that's why Bill is actually one of my so favorite successful. people. And, and so and, successful. And so successful. Exactly. And when you get to, um, you know, epicenters of this type of thing, like the Pentagon, where all these people are in one physical place, or the CIA, where they're all in one physical place, or Homeland Security, where they're all in one physical place. Once again, I'll mention that it's on the grounds of St. Elizabeth's Hospital in Washington, which was a famous insane asylum, that's where all of Homeland Security is. All these people think in terms of game theory to manipulate other people. So bad news. Bad news. All right. Next question. Uh, I've always found it curious and telling, frankly, that we use the term theater of war. Uh, and he uses the Latin term uh, theatium belli, I guess, when referring to areas of battle. What is the history of using this term? Does it come directly from the Romans? Through the years, I've given this some thought, and it would seem that for those that create wars, it is theater, maybe purely entertainment. Well, yeah, I'm sure it is entertainment for some of these people, but uh, it actually, uh, the word and theater itself comes from the Greeks, not the Romans. So, uh, I mean, the Greeks, the Greek emphasis, theaters were famous uh, much more than the Romans going to theaters. The Greeks used to go to theaters and have plays. We don't. Uh, the, the Romans had coliseums. Uh, coliseums, right. That's right. And Where games were played know. instead. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> different kind of, yeah. And the Greeks, the Greeks had, had theater. So um, anyway, theater of war. Uh, I don't think that World War III is, it's going to happen all over the world, but um, the whole world is, is going to be the theater of World War III, not just, you know, armies in one part of the world fighting other armies from the other force. It's going to be uh, a lot more loosey-goosey. Mm. Do you know where, have you ever... It is interesting, though, that they use the term theater of war. I wonder where that originated, where people started using that, you know, to describe a specific, like the Eastern Front or something, you know, the European theater. Like, a, it is interesting to choose that word. I don't know. I guess it would have been with the, um, when large states arise that could fight an enemy in many places. Well, to me, it gets back to the fact that the state is our enemy. It's the, the state that does this type of thing. I mean, normal people don't, don't do that. It's when they get organized into a state and the kind of people that inevitably uh, 
go to work for the state and rise to the top of it that like to think in those terms. Mm -hmm. All right, next question. This guy asking for some positive news. Is there anything positive to share? Like, how's it going in Argentina? Any positive trends starting there? Uh, I saw something about liberalizing uh, export tariffs on agricultural produce. Is that finally going to boost the value of Doug's Argentina investment in land? Or any other positive news on projects that seem to be working, such as free cities, uh, new concentrations of file people uh, springing up, et cetera? I think there are a number of free city and uh, free-ish community concepts materializing around the world. I don't keep a close track of them because I mean, I've, you know, I kind of shot my arrow on that with uh, that development in Cafajate in Argentina, which incidentally is kind of booming at this point. So, I so I, I, I think, I think we might actually get out even. <laughs> That's the first rule of investing, somehow get out even. <laughs> Certainly real estate investing. So absolutely, if you build, if you're stupid enough to build a, a golf course in a polo field. <laughs> but um uh I mean Malay's definitely doing a lot of interesting things in Argentina. That's definitely positive. I mean, there's a, yeah, a lot of I, suspicions, but yeah, I mean, like uh, the last thing I can remember that he's doing is uh, abolishing their um, uh, lookalike to NPR. Uh, right. I think we talked about that the other day. Yeah, has... they got rid of that. Yep. And I mean, he's, uh, yeah, he's definitely laying lots of people off, firing a lot of people, like getting, gave back all of the executives' uh, aircraft to the to the military, so that at least. So they're, you know, they can't be used by the uh, executive staff just for, as the old, as normal presidents might. Yeah, I've got to find, I'm sure somebody has done a study of exactly who he's fired and what agencies he's abolished so far. But I think there's a lot because I think he's, he's really serious about this. And he recognizes that uh, you've got to do it now and do it quickly. Uh, shock tactics, actually, and I think he's doing it. Although the, uh, you know, the forces of the enemy, the unions and the government employees and all the rest of them, the academics and professional, they're all fighting against it. We'll see what happens. I'm, yeah, I'm and the I'm optimistic. Well, wow, and he's definitely pushing everything in the right direction. I mean, that's for sure. He can be suspicious, but I mean. Yeah, you know, there's something going on I saw today that the governors of the Patagonian provinces uh, of Tierra del Fuego, Chibut, Rio Negro, and uh, a couple others created a, Pant a Patagonian treaty assigning a president of Patagonia. Oh, good. Well, maybe a secession is in order. I'm all I'm all for it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I'd love to see Argentina break up into a bunch of different countries, just like. It'll happen to the U.S. too. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, go. there's a lot of interesting things happening, you know, and when yes. you, we're introducing some chaos into the mix, that's what it needs to, to disrupt the system that's so in, entrenched. Yeah. What it's all about is these provinces, uh, Patagonia, they don't produce much, quite frankly. I mean, it's windblown plains and pretty mountains. That's about all they have. So they they were getting a lot of money shipped to them from Buenos Aires. But you can't print money up anymore, so they're not getting any more money. So, yeah. So they want us to see it, see how that works for them. I don't know how much of an economy can build on tourism, which is about all they have down there. Yeah, especially. I mean, it's, this is great free entertainment. It really is. It is. And I think there are a lot of positive things going on. I mean, you know, here... It's asked about uh, concentrations of file people springing up. Well, well there's a, there's been a lot of people that have moved down here to Uruguay, and we've you know, I mean, I there's a lot of great people here. I mean, uh, uh some people who file a VIP member who uh, his family is down here now uh, and is planning to be here for another at least few months, maybe much longer. You know, a couple of great kids, and they've been a lot of 
I mean, they're great. And there's a lot of them around. I mean, I, I was on a walk around my farm with one member of the pile and ran into another one on the walk. Like that's, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it, you know, there's, there's a lot of very positive things happening. Anytime you're looking at these abstract news, of course it's shit. And of course it is, but people are still doing good stuff. And I don't remember if we talked about the last time we did talk uh, about uh, two German couples that, uh, I had dinner with in Punta del Este, mm -mm. and uh, it was interesting uh, in that, uh, you know, they're quite international. They've lived around the world, but one thing they know is that they don't want to live in Germany anymore because Germany is rapidly going downhill with um, the worst kind of people in the government at this point, not to mention the uh, what's going on in this war in the Ukraine. So... Uh, and one thing they did mention is that before COVID, when they talked to their neighbors and friends, uh, they all thought they were kind of goofy. But now their neighbors and friends are asking them, well, where are you going? And tell me more. And that could be the beginning of a very large trend as people see the kind of the, I think the immigration thing is affecting people or the migration, I should say is changing, affecting people in a way none of this other stuff does. The creeping uh, encroachment of government, you know, the past, uh, this coming CBDC and the, you know, the digital wallet that was just approved by the EU, all that stuff is like, doesn't really scare people in the same way that the migrating hordes do. And that really is terrifying people in a way nothing else has. Yeah. And the thing is, is that a European coming from Germany, can't seek asylum in another country because it's just not credible. Hey, you're rich, you're white, you're from Germany, forget about it. But if you're a Muslim from, you know, Somalia or Guinea or someplace like that, yeah, well, welcome, come aboard. And <laughs> it's such a great deal seeking asylum, but they will. They will, and they are. And they are. And so that relates to one question about the, if I don't know if you saw the news about the the EU approving the EU-wide digital wallet last week. Did you see that news? Any impressions? Uh, inevitable. Inevitable. I mean, uh, you know, the, uh, the Hoi Ploi love their uh, iPhones and whatever it is. And they think it's convenient and have everything there and pay for it. And yeah, so I, I don't want to have anything to do with it. Although I probably won't be able to avoid it. I mean, if you're in China now, if you don't pay digitally, I understand, haven't been back to China for years now, that you basically can't pay for something. Mm -hmm. So we can, we can fight them as much as we can, but we're standing on the wrong side of history, it would appear. Yeah, and, and, and Europe is pretty far advanced in all this stuff. I mean, they've, you know, they talked about the CBDC definitely coming. They now have this digital, now they have a digital wallet. They want you to put something in it. And uh, I actually saw something, uh, they call it the digital product passport, which is another EU effort, which, you know, is will start this year where basically they have all products have the origin of them. So um, associated with an RFID or, a you know, a, uh, what do you call it? A QR code that's on the product. So you can see its origin and materials and of course, carbon footprint. Mm, so then course. any one of those you buy, you it'll be, it'll be, you know, counted against your allotment. Like that's all, it was, they're all there. Uh, it's on its way in Europe. Yeah. Well, and it's on our, it's on its way here. It's funny. Uh, just uh, actually it was just last night. I listened to a uh, presentation that Jordan Peterson made about the uh, ongoing uh, collapse of civilization. Uh, it was a five minute uh, uh, block he had to talk to the Congress. And uh, so he was going over his five minutes and by God, some congressman cut him off at the five minute mark because he was saying really true, absolutely true and scary things about uh, where this is going with uh, 
the social credit system and everything being digitized and cameras everywhere. And uh... But heaven forbid you go two seconds over your five minutes, right? That's the important thing. Keep things on schedule. Exactly. And you certainly don't want to hear this kind of stuff or have it widely disseminated, certainly. No. I mean, the white polloi might become restive or a few of them might become restive. They might. It's possible. I don't know. We haven't seen much of it, but I think it's coming. I think the migrant thing is going to push people over the edge. Yeah. I mean, Lenin was right. I mean, Lenin was right in a lot of ways. It's it's amazing. One of the most evil men in history. And by God, it turns out he is right in a lot of ways. And one of my favorite quotes from Lenin is, the worse it gets, the better it gets. Wow. Um, okay. Let's see. Next question here, then. Uh, says, I, it says, I've been told I'm a trustworthy person and that trustworthy people tend to be very trusting. The downside is I can more easily trust what people tell me. And these days, when lies are everywhere, how can I better evaluate the truth or or what I hear of it? That's a, I think that's a good observation. Um, is there... Are we, uh, uh, well, I think perhaps we should make a distinction between big lies and little lies. Uh, little lies are uh, things that might happen around the house. And they're interesting as character tests of people. You can determine whether you're lying. Did you steal the cookie from the jar or not? Okay, you can do an investigation and figure that out. Problem comes with big lies where you don't really know what's happening because you all you know is what you're told on your computer screen or in the newspaper. So the big lies are the danger, not the little lies. Um, so the question is, what can you do about it? <laughs> well, it does tend to make us all more cynical because most of the information we get is not firsthand anymore. It's, point that we've made a number of times in the past. So yeah, it's good to be suspicious. And also uh, consider the source. It's, uh, I think this is, if I quoted from Leonard, I think it deserves a quote from Jesus. And uh, wasn't it he who said, by your fruits, you shall know them. And if, uh, if the, uh, you know, if, if it's a rotten tree, the fruit is likely to be poisonous. So consider the source of any information that you get. I think it all yeah, kind of comes together. That's a great point. And what's the motivation behind the people that are giving you this information? Like what 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 what's their end game? Yeah, but those are that's great. Yeah. Fruits. Okay. All right, so let's see, next question. Was there ever a time, and I turned off my video just for internet connection issues, Doug, just to make sure it's smoother, just so you know. Uh, so the question is, was there ever a time when Doug liquidated a significant portion of his physical bullion holdings? And if so, under what circumstances? Well, first of all, I don't buy physical bullion. I only buy coins because they're much more fungible and liquid than, uh, than bars are. Although the fact is I do have a, a one kilo bar that I wound up with. Um, and the answer to the question is no, because gold is not a, is not an investment. It's it's money. It's a savings vehicle, and savings is not the same as investment investing, and it's not the same as speculating. I've gone over the the meanings of those words uh, many times in the past. So the answer to the question is no. Nor do I plan on ever doing that, except. Let's say if the world comes right, yeah, well, maybe I'll sell my gold and buy a high dividend solid stock if we live in a stable world. But I don't see that, certainly not over the next 10 years. Yeah, it's it's kind of like what, if you think of it as savings, you know, when would you even, when, when do you take profits on savings, right? Yeah. You don't do that. Yeah, exactly. It's like a, it's like a parachute. I mean, what are you going to sell your parachute? <laughs> exactly. 
All right. Okay. Next question. Over the last few years, we've seen the term stakeholder pop up everywhere. The term stakeholder, referring to someone who owns shares in a company, is heard seen much less frequently these days. I'm sorry. Yeah. Shareholder. What is Doug's take on the term stakeholder, what it means, and who does it exactly refer to? What do stakeholders own, and what is the role of stakeholders in society? It's, it's, it's a tentacle of this whole woke octopus. And uh, I first really had to deal with the concept of stakeholder when, well, I think this was years ago, we did a review of Bill Bonner's book, I forget the name of it, and John Mackey's book. And uh, John goes into this concept of a stakeholder a lot. I mean, he's a very nice guy. He's a mellow guy. He wishes people well, but he's a little bit naive where he thought, well, here at Whole Foods, you know, we, we like to look out for stakeholders. And the point that I would make is, hey, if you want the corporation to do something or not do something, you can become a shareholder. Otherwise, you're just a kibitzer and a busybody and a nuisance on, on, on the side. So this whole idea of stakeholders is very bad. It's giving people that don't have any actual skin in the game, uh, letting them decide what you're going to do. It's... Um, it's it's crazy and it's um, destructive and 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 because most shares today you know people don't buy shares anymore and they certainly nobody has share certificates which shows that you own any that's that's all gone frankly your ownership of shares is digital but you don't even have that basically uh, what you basically have is an ETF or a mutual fund or something like that run by somebody like BlackRock. So, uh, you know, the distinction between a shareholder and a stakeholder has been muddied and has been lost as a result. Now, I, I hate the concept of stakeholders. Abolish the thought. It makes, uh, the, the concept makes everything everyone else's business. You yeah. can always extrapolate it so that somebody has some justification for and for intervening in what you were doing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's, you know, it's it's one of these. It, it's part of the whole woke psychological conflict complex, and it's uh, should be discarded. Okay, uh, what do you think of Barrick Gold? I know it's a bit boring. However, it's still fairly priced, and they uh, about doubled their dividends to four to five percent. Look, I, gold stocks are very, very cheap right now relative to gold and relative to all kinds of things. So sure, it's great. But uh, Barrick is, Newmont's the biggest gold company in the world. Barrick is second biggest. I'm not sure. I think it is. But I don't know things like that. Uh, I don't want to get into investment uh, things. I mean, it's it's fine. It's fine. You're going to make a lot of money, I think in the next few years, holding big gold companies. But problem with big gold companies <clears throat> is that they're not run by founding entrepreneurs. They're run by suits, they're run by administrators, run by accountants, not by mining engineers and geologists that actually know the business and appreciate the product. And I don't know about Barrick in particular at this point, but I don't like big companies by comparison to smaller entrepreneurial companies. General statement, okay, that's all. Yeah, makes sense. Um, okay, someone asked a specific question on a, some, another company. You don't have to have any opinion on it, but they say, do you have an opinion on Ramico Resources, which announced in early 2023, it had found a deposit of rare earths on a 16,000 acre coal mine near Sheridan, Wyoming, that could be worth upward of $37 billion according to an estimate calculated by the Wall Street Journal. Hmm. Well, always be suspicious of these kind of things, but I'm not familiar with that company, but I'll look it up just to see if it's a, see if it's a promotional scam or not. Probably is, or, or it's probably, I, I've never heard of it before, but hmm. if they got rare earths, which were fashionable at the time, doesn't mean that they're there 
yeah, $37 billion worth of uh, rare earths, but it's totally uneconomic to retrieve them. That's, so it's true, but it's untrue. Maybe, it's, I don't know. $37 billion of resources you can get for $40 billion. You know, that kind of a scenario. Right. right. <laughs> That's okay. right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how does Doug make his today better than yesterday? Oh, you remember on Saturday Night Live, there used to be, uh, I think his name was Stuart Smalley. And whether that was his stage name or his real name, I don't know that either. But he would sit there on stage on Saturday Night Live years ago. And uh, in his uh, looking, you know, kind of effeminate, rather gay in his fluffy cardigan sweater. And he'd say, in every day, in every way, I'm getting better and I'm getting stronger. And I'm a good person, darn it. I, I thought it was a very funny and, little and skit. And then it was like, and gosh darn it, people like me, I think was the last thing. That's right. That, that's, that's, that's right. <laughs> well, you know, I'm a, I'm skeptical about self-improvement books and so forth. I, they have value. Some of them can be very good. But uh, what do I do? Well, I, I don't have a real plan. I try to learn a little bit more every day. Try to throw sand on the slippery slope when I have the willpower to do it every day. But uh, I don't have any panaceas. I'm sorry. Okay. All right. In 1980, the USA hockey team beat a far superior USSR hockey team. It was called the Miracle on Ice. What do you think the chances of Millet succeeding in the Miracle of Argentina? I want so badly to believe he can do it, but can't imagine how the powers that be would allow it. Yeah, well, they're certainly going to fight against it. The powers be internationally and nationally, but um, if they don't kill them, uh, listen, I'm optimistic. It's good to be optimistic about something. It's good that there's something in the world out there that you can be you know, righteously optimistic about. Yeah, so I'm optimistic about it. Um, next guy says, from my viewpoint, the first time he was elected, Trump made atrocious appointments of people who did not support his agenda. A few exceptions, maybe, but overall atrocious. Do you think, Doug, that if votes are counted honestly and he's reelected, Trump will do a better job of appointing cabinet and other staff members? Yeah, well, there's two views you can take on that. And you're absolutely right. The people he surrounded himself with were it was like chosen to be horrible. I mean, all these people, I don't know, maybe think that his judgment is absolutely abysmal. But uh, so on the one hand, uh, the leopard doesn't change its spots and he's got some character flaw, or the way he's wired where he chooses bad people, maybe. Uh, so he'll do it again. On the other hand, he's not a stupid guy, and maybe he's learned his lesson, and uh, he'll improve. So which is it going to be? Well, as the perpetual optimist I am, I'd like to think it's the second. And he'll, he'll choose much, much better people, and he won't allow himself to be pressured because he's been there and done that. So who knows? But like I said, I'm the perpetual optimist, as we all know. All right. Uh, let's see. Sorry, next question. Uh, when does Doug think the conflagration of citizens against illegal invaders will occur in light of the revelations of Tucker Carlson's discussion with Brett Weinstein about the Darien Gap and the engineered nature of the invasion, particularly with Chinese nationals stealthy mixed in with the rabble? Yeah. That is a $64 question. What do you think? I think we talked about before. I think it's going to, you'll start to see pushback from, you know, in the, from the urban youths or in the inner city, I think first, because, you know, you have people who are already living in poverty, already feel like they've been slighted by the system and they're being, 
they see this advantage given to people who are just showing up. And so I would imagine it's going to start around that uh, anytime you'd see any like pushback. I think that's where it'll start. That's a good point. That's a good point. And uh, eventually, soon, I think, these, uh, you know, these imported young males will form gangs because, you know, hey, they're living, you know, they're strangers in paradise and they don't have anything to do. And they can see that the current occup occupants of paradise are weak and soft. So, yeah, they'll form mafias, lots of them. And maybe that'll motivate some Americans. Yeah. What do you think about the Chinese national part when you see these bunch of uh, groups of Chinese people coming in? I've heard about that. <clears throat> Michael Yan, of course, investigates this type of thing a lot, too. And um, he indicates that the Chinese all group together and uh, don't talk to outsiders. Well, yeah. Who are they? Why are they there? All kinds of questions. No answers. It's suspicious. It is suspicious. I, I will. I, the, the last statistics I saw, though, it was only where I think in 2022 or 2023, I think that was 20,000 Chinese nationals were officially uh, crossed. But compared to other nations, it's a tiny, tiny fraction. I mean, yeah. Yeah. And I've never seen a real breakdown of who these, well, how many, how many of these people are there over what period of time? I mean, 30 million starting way back when, or 20 or 10, certainly. Sounds like there's at least 10 million. And then, of course, we heard that there were 302,000 that were actually flown in. Uh, forget about crossing the Darien Gap and the border, but flown in. Uh, so that's three. Well, who were those 300,000? I don't think we ever got a breakdown of uh, name, rank, and serial number of those people. They won't even say where they came from or where they were sent to. Yeah, or how they might be supporting themselves wherever they are. It's now this is this is actually insane. It's clinically insane importing people and paying them to come here and fuck things up because they will. These people are Yes, these people are not the immigrants that came in in the 19th and early 20th century. They were not subsidized and, and they subsidized. came for opportunity. These people are, and like Trump said, what, some of them are good people. Well, yeah, I'm sure that's true. But, uh, yeah, I'm sure it is. I'm sure it is true. But, it, you know, even if you assumed in the 10 million that have come in officially since Biden took office that, uh, you know, only 50,000 of them are just loathsome criminals, like actually a danger to society. If only 50,000 of them are, then that is a disaster for everyone involved. I mean, it'll, it'll ruin any kind of, you know, hopes that the people who came here, you know, with honest intentions might have. It'll ruin the society that they come into. I mean, they look at these statistics of uh, the people who commit crimes in New York City, for instance, and it's like, you know, it's like 300 people who are doing it over and over again and keep getting released. It's not out of this millions of people there. It doesn't take many that if you don't enforce a law to destroy the society. So, it doesn't. yeah, well, these people have the wrong incentives. You cannot pay people to come and hang around. It's crazy. It's actually clinically insane. It is. And they're doing it everywhere. Um, let's see where else. What's the next question here? Uh, the next question relates to this. The immigration crisis is international. It's happening in Europe, the United States, Australia, and Japan. Who's calling the shots? Are they trying to see or sow the seeds of chaos? This is a conspiracy if it's happening in every Western aligned country. Maybe it's a conspiracy. I mean, that seems possible to me, but on the other hand, Maybe it's just that we're at a stage of civilization where we're experiencing a kind of mass psychosis. It's happened before in history. Maybe it's happening right now. Mm -hmm. uh, the the uh, West has lost confidence 
in itself. The West no longer believes it's uh, better or different or good or any of the other things that Stuart Smalley used to say. In fact, it's like it's like the average European and American is is, is sitting there in his fluffy cardigan sweater, <laughs> saying he thinks he's 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 better and he's nicer and a good person. And and meanwhile, you know all these all these tough third world people think we're pushovers and they're by and large right it's mass psychosis i think maybe that's the explanation as much as conspiracy yeah i mean it could be mass psychosis that then just simply relates to policy and the policies that are adopted by all these countries are ones that makes this that that legitimizes this whole process and find and funds it yeah well that old saying you know Tough men make for good times and weak men make for, well, we don't have just weak men in running the country. We've got actually evil men. I would say that I'm accurate in saying they're evil as well as weak. Evil, weak, and stupid. That's a really bad combination to uh, run a powerful country. Yeah, no kidding. Okay. In a laboratory, it is possible to direct the evolution of microorganisms so that they have certain characteristics. So did slavery in all its forms and every time inadvertently create a petri dish for directed or forced evolution because only the strongest and fittest survived? Um, I don't think so. Because slavery is a temporary situation. And... Uh, even if the son of a slave became a slave, I mean, it wasn't like people being bred to be slaves. It's not like dogs. I mean, most of the, in fact, all the breeds of dogs we have today were bred. Well, we can't do that and have not done that with other people. So mm. I don't think so. Okay. Uh, in past podcasts, you have been bullish about nanotechnology. Uh, have the ongoing revelations about the disastrous effects of mRNA vaccines and how use of nanotech delivery systems uh, have been used as, as that that's been detrimental to human health. Has that changed your thinking about nanotech? Uh, no, it hasn't really, uh, because I remain of the opinion that technology is a really good thing. It's what's brought us out of grubbing for roots and berries in the mud and the higher technology gets, the better things are, will get. And nanotechnology may be the ultimate technology, especially now as quantum computers are being developed. So now you can have really powerful computers that are molecular sized. Mm. That's basically the direction it's going to, to run the assemblers to... Uh, so, uh, nope. Uh, it's just like gunpowder. You know, the bad guys got it first and used it to suppress the peasants. Then the peasants got it and used it to take out armored knights and castles on the hillside. And it's mm -hmm. going to be the same thing with nanotechnology as well. At least, like I said, once again, I'm the uh, perennial optimist. All right. Is, uh, is polo as popular as it was in your prime? I don't know because I haven't kept up with uh, I haven't kept up with polo. Hmm. So uh, is it? I actually don't know. Uh, I actually don't know. Uh, then I have to I'll have to investigate that. Are there other activities that are comparable to uh, to polo in terms of it being a passport into societies? Well, I think golf and tennis are kind of marginally, you know, ultra ritzy kind of sports. I mean, you can't be penniless and play them really. Uh, but the thing with polo is that, um, look, a professional sportsman uh, has a passport any place in the world. If somebody knows that you're a super athlete, or playing a, uh, you know, a, any sport at the highest level, that's a passport in itself for any sport. 
And the thing about playing polo is that you can, if you play basketball, you're not going to be able to hire LeBron James and Michael Jordan and whoever to play with you. That ain't going to happen. But if you play polo, yeah, you can hire the polo equivalents of those guys to play with you. It's not cheap, but you can do it. And uh, I think that's part of the cachet of polo. You can play with the best in the world. And that makes it much more of a community than, I don't, I don't know if there's an international golf community that all know each other, so to say. Yeah, you know. It's Probably except, people who are on the tour. People on the tour, yeah. Out, yeah. Yeah, but, you know, I was never on the tour. I was just a guy who liked to ride horses and hit a ball. That's all. <laughs> so that's the thing about polo. I mean, you can run in the at the highest levels without deserving it, quite frankly. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Last question, Doug. Uh, what question do you wish members of the file would ask you, but don't? You're doing a good job. Okay. All right. Good. Well, we'll leave it there then for this week. So have a good yeah. weekend. See you next week. Okay. Thanks, Matt.